Hi, everyone. I hope you're doing well today. Um, I'm Kristen Boddy. I'm the Membership and Events Manager at the Asheville Art Museum. Thanks so much for taking some time to join us today. It looks like some folks are still logging in, um, but we're going to get started now anyway. So I'm very excited to welcome Ralph Burns, who will be leading today's program. Ralph is an acclaimed documentary photographer and was also one of the photographers in residence during the museum's construction. He has a show opening at Blue Spiral on July 3rd, so very soon, and I hope you'll all feel inspired to go check it out after today's program. Um, so before I turn this over to him, I just want to go over some housekeeping for all of our attendees. So first, microphones are muted and video is turned off by default. You should know that we are recording today's program and if you prefer not to be recorded, please make sure that your audio and video remain off. And you can check this by looking at the bottom left of your screen where you'll see a microphone and video camera symbol. If they have red lines through them, they're off. Um, next, you also have two options for asking questions or making comments. The first is to type your question or comment into the chat box, which you should also find at the bottom of your screen. I encourage you to enter your questions as we go, and we will get to those during breaks uh, in the presentation. The second option is to use the raise hand feature, which you'll find by clicking on the participants button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, when there's time, I will call on anyone with a raised hand, unmute you, and you can speak directly to Ralph. Finally, if you think there's anything we can do to improve these programs within Zoom, please do let us know. I'll send out an evaluation this afternoon so you can share your feedback with us that way, or you can feel free to email me directly. So thank you again, and now I will unshare my screen and turn this over to Ralph who will share his. I think we're doing good here. Yes. You'll have to all pardon me because I have moved from actual to digital to virtual in a very short period of time, it seems. Um, so Ralph, it seems that it's not, it's a, an email or a web page that's up on the screen, not well, that, the... Well, definitely not the email. Let's try that again. Yes. Uh, let's sh new share, and here we go. I think share. There we go. There so we go. So, if you just press the play button, we'll see the full screen. Yeah. Here we Great. go. Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm hiding in my little. Uh, cave and and um, it's sort of amazing to me that we can still connect like this. Uh, Pam knows a lot about all of us and Pam invited me to uh, tour the building site for the new museum and I think Pam knew when she asked me to visit the site that I would be motivated to want to do something and she was correct. When, when I went to the site and looked at what was happening, I was really struck by the number of people engaged in the process of building a building, all the trades and people that, I, I, people who I never see. So it struck me as I was watching this process that doing portraits of people who actually built buildings and did things, and in particular, this museum would be a great idea. So I said to Pam, hey, I have this idea. Why don't I take some photographs of the workers? And Pam looked at me like, of course, I knew you were going to do that. And she said, let's get on with it. And that is what we did. So I set up a little uh, studio in the museum under construction. Now, I have never done this before. I'm not a studio photographer. I've really never have worked in a studio. And I've very rarely have used lights, uh, and generally it was lights to do copy work or something more mundane. So I thought, why not? This can't be that difficult. So we set up this studio in the building and um, proceeded from there. Now, I have to say, this is very contested space. 
meaning that the trades are all in there. They're all working under great pressure and duress. So I at times would find myself in the way of another wave of tradesmen and women coming through and I'd have to move my studio. And then I would disappear for a week or two, I think in some case, a month or two, and I'd come back and find that the studio, such as that is, was moved and I had to reassemble it someplace else and then begin the process anew of uh, cajoling people to come and pose for me for this nebulous project, at least nebulous in their minds. So my first photograph I took is this. Uh, a, this person worked with the company that put the security systems and the fire protectant work in. And I'm just going to go through these fairly quickly. Uh, again, I was really struck by, by the lack of visibility of these people who do all of this work. Uh, and we sort of don't know they exist. And yet they really hold the whole system together. They, they build everything, they repair everything, they come to work early in the morning, they have arduous jobs, they have really, other than financially, in many cases, unrewarding jobs. Uh, but in each and every case, I found uh, great pleasure and great communication between myself and, and the photo people I photographed. So I'm just going to go, as I said, through these a little. Let's... This guy, his name is Alan Surratt. He was there all the time. He was a, a sheetrock of finisher. And I purposefully went off the white background. Uh, and that's what I set up, this white background. And I have a light on the background to sort of blow it out so they seem to be floating there. But I went off the background so you could contextualize the 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 process uh, so that's just rare wall the, the the bare walls going there if you look at alan's left hand on his finger the second one from his belt you can see uh blood uh, it was a common sight there to see the the work men and women uh injuring themselves during a day uh trying to do this construction this person was very interesting he worked with his dad but he clearly was the dad. He was the dad to his own dad. He had taken his father in clearly to help his father out. And I don't know what the backstory is there, but I watched them every day and I watched this young man who here seems very removed and, and resolved to work with great tenderness with his father. So Sam, Sam uh, was struggling with cancer during this period and would disappear for a week or two at a time uh, and then come back. He always had nonetheless a very cheerful countenance and, and uh, was always a friend. He always came, searched me out when I was there and we caught up in each other's lives. He won my heart because he has a Moss Hill Lions jacket on and my, my dear companion Leela works and teaches at Moss Hill so he was a natural to, to get into the final selection. But again, th th there's this tenderness you see in people who we don't normally see in this world. We see them walking down the street. We see them getting in their cars. We see them wearing their yellow jackets. But up close, each one of them has an amazing story. I just love those eyes. Gentleman worked with the heating and air conditioning people. This was Blaine. He was uh, one of the plumbers. Did I watched this man work day in and day out? He would come in. He worked very quietly and very much alone. And because I came irregularly, it was really interesting. I would I would not be there for five, six, seven days, two weeks, and I'd come back. And I would see what this man had done in the period of time that I was gone. The thing you don't see day by day and the, the intricate nature of the construction that he did within this expanding space. 
That's Angel. Angel was, uh, I have other pictures of everyone. I have some of him where you see more of his face. But again, this great, this great beauty that flows out of this man, this twinkle, he was a fireproof. He sprayed, and you can see it on his hat, he sprayed this fire retardant substance on everything. And if you stood in one place long enough, Angel would probably spray fire retardant on you too. I sadly don't remember what this gentleman, who, who he worked with, but he was, he was one of those people when I first approached was a bit taciturn and, and um, uh, cautious. But once we chatted for over a couple of days, he, he stepped forward and I just love this image. I love the, the power and the strength and the directness. This was one of the iron workers. Iron workers are not paid enough. So I'm gonna say. Another one of the iron workers. Again, this is one of these people whose only name I got from him was Jose, which I'm not sure is his actual and correct name. A tender, tender person. I mean, I just would talk to him at times and you would, you would see this whole almost facade, but I, I assume it's also real of, of, of uh, macho, I'm an iron worker, you just sort of fade away. You get a look at the, the, you'd see the little boy in him and you'd see the story and you'd give me little bits of his life story. Uh, and I think in that photograph, I, what I like about this in particular is I think in his face, he somehow manages con to convey both of those things, both a child tenderness, a vulnerability, but also a sort of uh, strength and a, and a macho-ness. Now, I don't know how that happened, but obviously technology and I, I'm gonna go back through these and get, there we go. So there are a number of women on site and it was again a great thing to see. It was very fascinating to watch the, the mini culture in the trades and in the construction world where there were people of all ethnicities and increasingly of all genders and, and people, you would still see the kind of uh, uh, hints of uh, hazing uh, that goes on, but it was very, very small. And uh, anyway, that's all of these. Uh, oh, wait, no, Pam's here. Pam's doing a tour. Uh, Pam did so many tours when I was there, and I was there very seldom. And if Pam wasn't doing a tour, Rebecca was doing a tour. And if Rebecca wasn't doing a tour, someone else was doing a tour. It was very fascinating to watch that also, because you realize that a project like this is not only this amazing complexity of, of design and execution in the trade, but there was another level going on at all times. And that was Pam and Rebecca and other people bringing people through the building, bringing people to see what was doing, get, getting comments from people, encouraging people to support the process. Uh, I, for me, it was a great opportunity. I mean, I've been involved. I worked on oil rigs in my younger life. I've seen a lot of stuff, but I have never been inside of a construction like this. And the, the, the layering and complexity and all the work that goes on both beyond the actual construction and into construction was very uh, uh, awakening, I think is the word for me. Uh, any questions about this section? Yes, we had a few questions that came in. So Laurel wants to know, um, were most of the workers willing to be photographed? It's a great question. And it was the hardest thing for me because at some point I, I began to feel like a full of brush salesman. I mean, I, I would go up there and I would sort of hang out and people were busy and they were working and I had to go grab them and somehow convince them to come. Some were very willing. There were a few, and, and there are many more portraits than this. There are a few that it took uh, months for me to get to pose. Uh, and there were some who never, never uh, uh, agreed to do this. Uh, and I think it wore me down in a certain way. I felt like an interloper. 
uh, again, as I said earlier, this is contested space, and I'm sort of something that they don't know quite what to do with. Uh, but I did find something that was fascinating. Many of the of the workers understood that what I was doing was not dissimilar to what they did. That is, it required a craft, it required a certainty, it required setup, it required measurement. And when when that was recognized by a few people, they became more interested in what I did uh, as opposed to what I was trying to do. So that was a, uh, uh, that, that eased me into the situation, but it was hard. And there were a couple of people who gave me a hard time the whole time. And I, I found myself at times avoiding going there because of that. And it's my issue, not theirs. But, uh, but the ones who, whose pictures you see stepped forward at some point, obviously. Great. Um, Mary wants to know how much did you suggest for the poses for the photos or were those natural to the one I, who was I, being right. photographed? Good question. I didn't suggest. Now, there are, you know, I mean, there, there, I didn't suggest, but obviously I said, would you stand there? And, you know, I would generally say something. I just want you to be you. I want you to, to, uh, show yourself as you would like to be seen and seen and then whatever else. Uh, and most of them got it, but I didn't, I never said move right, move left. Now I did framing uh, and I made decisions. Obviously every time you take a photo, make a photograph, you're making all kinds of decisions. Photography is really a very subjective, in fact, the whole notion of documentary photography is really suspicious to me and it's become more suspicious the older I've become and the more I've worked in the field, but it's a very subjective process. So the framing, the moving, the left, the right, some of that I did, of course, but but I would just say stand and, and I would give them parameters. I would say this is sort of, you know, I do kind of this, this is kind of what I'm seeing and you can move in there you want. Then when I went back through, some people I took 10, 15, 20 shots of, when I went back through that, then I chose, so in some sense, though I didn't tell them how to pose, I chose a pose. Maybe it's the most honest answer to that. Great, uh, I think that answers Mary's question, a uh, different Mary who was asking about how you decided where to place people on the screen. Um, Bet wants to know uh, if you gave workers a copy of their portrait. Oh, that's a uh, no. They were, I, I, it was a very simple thing. I said if they wanted copies, I said, well, that's not true. I've sent five or six out digitally. I didn't give hard copies, I guess is the correct answer. And I let people know how to get in touch with me if they wanted copies, but uh, I'm still, I mean, I'm, I'm, very willing to share the, the photographs are in the museum's collection or they're, they're somewhere on a hard drive. And the museum has full use of them and I have full use of them. And anyone whose photograph I took will have full use of their photograph if they want it, if that's what you want to hear. Yes, and I we did exhibit a number of these works when we first opened up in the studio space. So I hope some of you were able to see that. And if you didn't, I do believe some of the photos are in our catalog Envisioning the Future, which is about the construction process and how we got from point A to point B in creating the new museum. Um, and so one last question, or actually, I'm sorry, Two. Um, so Judy wants to know, um, given that photography is subjective, what do you think is particularly you in these portraits? For instance, in your selection of the people's expressions or posture? That, that's a, a question that uh, I've not thought of. I think what's particularly me is I really was trying to find something in each one of these people as much as you can in a portrait, in, in a still moment, that revealed a level back, uh, and that's what I think I did in most of them. I think if we, you know, if we look at them, I'm gonna run back through them a little bit. You know, there, there's a there was an attempt, and in both in when I worked with them. Now to the question of posing, of course, I'm talking, and I would say, you know, I would say things like, you know, relax. I mean, I would do those sort of prompts, you know, relax or you know, don't be so serious. And a couple of there was a couple of people who were who at first, I think I used the line, you know, this isn't a uh, 
Department of Motor Vehicle photograph we're doing here. So I would do, there was a chat that went on, but there was no touching, no hands-on, no, uh, uh, no, okay, move your shoulder, do this, tilt your head. That was all there. So to that question, I think I was trying to get into, there's a person here in each and every one of these people. And again, I go back to the theme that when Pam first took me through the building, I was struck by all of these people working and all these people who are unseen and all these people who I assume have a deep and meaningful inner life and all of these people who, to whom I think their existence is a meaningful thing. So I tried to find, if it's a cliche, I think, to say what I'm gonna say, but it's the only word that comes to mind. I tried to find a hint of their humanity. Uh, are you women to I'm not sure how one would say that. And, and to say, look, we're all here, we're all here together. We, we, we work at different, uh, functions and different, we have different realities, except we all have the same reality. I think perhaps that was one of the motivating uh, things as I did these photographs, is that we, we all have the same reality, uh, and we all live to live, and we do what we do because that is what we do, and we remain, though, forever ourselves with this one life that we have. So that's, I think, is an answer to that question. Great, um, and I'll just read one comment from Norma before I tell you the last question. So Norma just wanted to say, wonderful portraits and great composition. Love seeing the uniforms. Thank you for honoring these men and women. Oh, that so. must be that Norma Bradley. I hey Norma. It is. You. And I see <laughs> Jay Richard Gruber in my, I don't see many people here in my lineup, but uh, he's turning his head left and right. <laughs> I don't know if Jay Richard Gruber, or Sir Richard, as I like to call him, uh, curated the exhibition, uh, my exhibition at the Museum of Persistence and Vision in 2014. And before that was the, the founding director of the Ogden Museum of Southern Art. A, a wonderful man and a good friend and a, and a great human being and a person to whom I turn to when I need to know something. Okay, we're going to leave this world. Oh, we went to Pam again. Another tour, as I say, it was always, it was the most ubiquitous event. Um, so we're going to go to, to now for many of you, perhaps most of you aren't familiar with my work. Some of you I know are. But I'm going to go to the core of my work so you can sort of contextualize this body of work, the portraits, against what I really do. And it was a very interesting thing for me to do both of those things. Uh, this is in New Orleans, I, I think in the late 60s. I think it's one of the few surviving negatives of that period. Uh, that I don't know what happened to them, they disappeared, but there are a few images out. This is in Jackson Square, uh, probably will be called something else soon, uh, right outside of the cathedral, of, which is the building to the top right. And there was this religious group there and I stopped and I watched and I have always been attracted by the moment of ecstasy, by, by the moment of transcendence or the attempt for transcendence. And in some sense, I watched this young woman play this instrument and the people behind her sort of half watching her. And I watched her go in and out of the state in which she removed herself from everything around her and did what she did. And, and that's one of the kind of themes I, I tend to work with. So this is an early thing for me in my photographic career. Another thing, and this was on the cover of the catalog that the museum did for the 2014 show. Growing up in New Orleans, I grew up in a deep, rich, and at that time, innocent Catholicism. Innocent meaning that the reality of, of, of what was going on hadn't been made manifest yet. And there was also this, this folk mystery that went on. And this is one of these scenes that could just as well have been me, that little boy who's being dragged away by his mother from this scene. The, 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 the city was full of mystery and, and magic and depth and 
transcendence again. There was something always about to happen. So this is not New Orleans. Many years later, I wound up living, not so many years later, actually, I wound up living in a village in Nepal, uh, a village whose name is Bodhna. It's a Tibetan Buddhist village. And in the village is a large stupa, which is a block circle with this huge mound on it. That's a holy site. And there's, there's images of the visage of the Buddha on top of the stupa. And I would get up in the morning and at, it was foggy in the morning. We, you know, we're getting a little bit high in the Himalayas here. And I'd watch all morning as people would crawl by, walk by, and they would do these circular ambulations, I guess, of the stupa. It would take maybe seven, eight minutes to go around it. And it would spin these, these things that are inserted into the wall of prayer wheels, many wheels. And they would spin them as they, as they go past. Uh, prayers for themselves, prayers for the universe. And I realized watching that, that innate in the human experience, it seems to me, is this desire to know something else? Is this desire to transcend? Is this desire to connect to something beyond? That, that the, the moment here, the moment on earth seems to be predicated against something else as opposed to being just the moment here on earth. And I think that helped inform as I moved forward what it was I, I tried to pursue this act of looking, of seeking, of trying to find something where something either does or doesn't exist. This is in New Orleans. It's a little shrine. Uh, the story is if you come to the shrine and, and pray, uh, you'll be healed. And on the wall, you see all the, the uh, uh, crutches and braces. And in fact, in the, there's a little bowl in the center saint that she's holding. It's an eye a false eye in it, and, and this woman on the bottom left sort of looking in. It's, it's just one of the images to me that says so much about us as a species. Again, New Orleans, this, this, this notion of, of seeking, honoring, worshiping something that exists not simply here, but exists something else, somewhere else, and how that informs our life. The, the other thing that became very clear to me uh, you cannot grow up in New Orleans and not be aware of death uh, and the rituals of death. I grew up in a, in a really little city across the river from New Orleans uh, named Gretna. And it was not an unusual event in my youth to wake up on, it was generally a Saturday morning, uh, to hear the jazz band funeral procession coming down the street next to my house and then turning sort of right in front of the house I lived in and going one block where there was a cemetery. At that time, cemeteries were segregated, probably the second most segregated space in America, and they would have a burial ceremony. And I was struck by two things during that, three things. First was the difference in form and ritual. Second was the clear sense of loss and, and, and um, mo moaning, mourning that went with it. And third was the sense of joy and happiness when the funeral was over and the band cut loose. Uh, for a while I lived in a, or stayed in a, in a place in India called Varnasi, uh, um, Benares Varnasi, and I watched the, the bodies, it's day and night, coming down to the burning gods. And, and there death is so integrated into the culture. And here what struck me about this image is, is death is not integrated. Uh, well into our culture. In fact, somebody feels that they need to walk down the street with a sign that says death is sure, I think, to remind us of that notion. This is Asheville, 1977, Billy Graham. It's, it's, this, ex, this image is in the Blue Spiral exhibit. Um, and I'm fascinated with the people who have answers and tell us answers and who tell us what the meaning of life is and how they go about what they do. This is also an exhibit uh, in the exhibit at Blue Spiral. It's a, probably 1976, 77, could be 75. Uh, it's, I know somewhere what that is, but so 
little car on Lexington Avenue in Asheville where these, the, the woman who was driving the car left, but they would drive around preaching from their car. This is the road to Penland. Uh, if you can't read the sign, it says problems, follow the instructions, the Holy Bible. Again, this no notion of text, this notion of answer, this notion of we've already got this figured out. We know you're looking, but here, here is the answer. Uh, you, you'll see later in here lots of images of, of text. I'm very, very fascinated with how humans turn not to the future, but to the past and turn for answers that have already been codified um, and it crosses all faiths of course everybody has their own book uh, this was in Neshoba County Mississippi I was just struck by this on so many different levels first of all it's only half this is from 1 Corinthians I think it says yeah oh yeah 1 Corinthians 7 something or other uh, maybe 14 um, it's only half because it says the other thing too and then the the husband is uh, sanctified by the, by the wife, but this person felt that only really needed to, to say one thing of it. But the thing, another thing that really struck me is this is a thousand yards at the most from where the bodies of the three civil rights workers, Cheney, Swerna, and Goodman, who were killed in 1964 in Neshoba County, Mississippi, on their way to check on a church, the Mount Zion Church, I think it was, that had been set on fire, a place where they were getting ready to lead some, some uh, workshops. Uh, they were murdered at night. Well, they were arrested first. Uh, and that sound is my dog. She really gets annoyed when she thinks I'm talking to myself. So she might do this a few times. Uh, but, but here in, is this religiosity and this guidance you know, right in a place where a whole nother mentality is and still is, was and still is at work. So in 1977, Elvis Presley died, as most people can never forget. Um, and I was struck by his passing. Elvis Presley had a role in my life early on. I, I remember when Elvis Presley became a thing and it lasted in my life three or four years, and then the Beatles and the Stones and that path happened. So when Elvis Presley died in 1977, I, I was taken by it. I felt a sense of loss. It was a sense of also the brevity of life, but I didn't pay it a lot of attention. In 1978, a year later, I was working in my dock room on August the 15th. He died on the 16th, and a news report came on AM radio, we didn't have FM then uh, here in Asheville, uh, that hundreds of Elvis fans were gathering uh, at his home to honor his life. And I was like, wow, that's kind of an interesting thing. An hour later, I'm still working in the dark room and I hear the same news report as ABC saying a thousand, thousands of Elvis fans are gathering spontaneously at Graceland. And I just knew that I had to go. I wasn't sure why I had to go. I understood that this had something to do with some of the themes that I work with. It had something to do with love and loss and need and looking out where, looking someplace else, looking for purpose, looking for meaning, looking for love even perhaps. So I went to Graceland in 1977, 1978. I got in my car that day on August the 15th, had no idea really how far Memphis was. The interstate highway system wasn't built yet through the mountains, wasn't completed. So it was a, 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 a I think I went through Nantahala actually to, to get there. Uh, and I drove all night and arrived. And this photograph is from that first, the next day, August the 16th, 1978. I thought I'd go there uh, for once or twice. Turned out I went there for over 30 years on and off, birthday, death day. And here's about seven or eight, I think, images, maybe more, from that project. The, the, the sense of loss, the sense of love, the sense of, of bereavement really moved me. It's really easy to make fun of people. It's really easy to see the people, people as the other people have no, what's wrong with them. I, I once said in an interview that if I had to be 
sequestered on an island with only a few hundred people, who would I choose? And I would say about 50 of them would come from people I met at Graceland, Elvis fans. I found them to be remarkably honest, open, refreshingly open, and, and very much in touch with their emotions. And they could explain exactly why they felt it. Didn't mean that I felt that, didn't mean that I identified with that, but it, it was truly a, a touching thing to, to be part of this long process of grief and loss. And it turned eventually as people died and generations shifted into a adulation that I, I, I don't understand totally now. I understood this first iteration of it, uh, but it's somebody else, else's concern at this point. There was always a sense of sensuality there, and especially in the early years, it was very, very clear that these, that mostly women, there were some men also, really loved Elvis Presley, that Elvis Presley did something, meant something. I had one woman, I have oral histories, one woman told me Elvis Presley made her the woman she is today, that it was listening to Elvis Presley, that she, now let's contextualize this. This is a time when women were, were not as uh, uh, free to express themselves as we have evolved to, to becoming. And this woman said that it was, you know, Elvis Presley listening to him where she found the woman, in her exact words, where I found the woman in me. This was not an uncommon theme. The, the, the notion of age and getting old to these people, these people, I'm sorry, use it to, to the Elvis fans, it just didn't exist. Uh, I, I, one woman said, would you stop loving your mother if she was fat or if she became addicted? No, you wouldn't. You would love her even more. You would understand their humanity. You would understand that they too are going through the same process of life. That's a cigarette. I like the cigarette machine. I pulled many a handle on those machines in my day, uh, sadly. It's 1980 on the, the certificate, 80 cents a pack. You could take that machine to Manhattan today, you'd be wealthy. You could afford an apartment for a couple of weeks. A lot of this went on, people you know, dressing like Elvis, imitating Elvis, a lot of young people doing it. And no, I did not sleep with either one of them. It's a question I'm asked often, or I make it up actually, no one's ever asking that. This is a woman in her room at a motel near Graceland. Uh, every year in the early years, the first 15 or so, fans would gather at three or four motels and hotels around Graceland, and they would decorate their rooms and they would set up these displays. And this woman just happened to have a fully articulated porcelain Elvis stall in her bed. And I asked her if I could come in and photograph her. And this is the last photograph I took. I was actually sitting on the other side of the room talking to her and recording. And as I got up to leave, the voice said, go to the other side of the room. And I said, do you mind if I go around to the other side of the room? And she said, no. And, you know, thank you, Elvis, is all I can say. Uh, this dear being, uh, Pat Ogilvie is her name, died at Graceland at the 30th or during the 30th anniversary of Elvis's death. Uh, she died of a heat stroke. I just love the way the hair kind of mimics the clouds and, and the lips, even though the lips are sliced through by the railing. I mean, there's no doubt who that is. The, the opulence and the sensuality of that, that figure is just amazing. Uh, transcendence, perhaps, again, I, I like this idea that through any form, any, any avatar, one can find a place. That young boy's name was Dwayne. I became friends with he and his mother and his, I think it was his stepdad, actually. I think only Dwayne is still with us. It's so one of the interesting things about a project like this over 30 years, 30 plus years now, is how many people you, you get to know and then you go back and someone comes up to you and says, oh, do you know that you know, this dad or this person died? Um, it, it, it was a, uh, in and of itself, uh, 
a reminder. In fact, these two people here, uh, Annie and Jerry, uh, Jerry's on the right, Annie's on the left. Uh, Jerry has, is no longer with us. Okay, that's the Elvis, that's the How Great Thou Art section. Any questions on that? And we had just one more section and then we'll have open, open story. Any questions here? I don't know. Can you hear me, Kristen? Have I gotten lost? Yes. Sorry. Oh, okay. Suddenly, there I just, go. It just took me a second. Suddenly, I had the feeling like, no, I've just been doing this for myself. It all died. No, I mean, no, not at all. We do have a, quite a few questions that came in. So the first one's from Judy. And she asks, do you seek those moments of transcendence for yourself by photographing people? And do you think this is typical of art photographers? Well, first, I don't know what, I, and I'm not trying to cribble with you, Judy. I don't know what the word art photographer, documentary, it's something I'm not comfortable with and I would be presumptive to try to, to answer a question based on art photography. And I don't, I have to say, I don't consider my work art photography, but uh, do I seek trans, I, tr I, 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 I seek knowledge. I think I, I seek understanding. Uh, and if that brings transcendence, then I'm very happy. I, I, I seek the shared moment. Uh, and in this next section, which is in Israel, you know, there's a couple of those, which you'll see. I, I really look when I photograph for a moment that I emotionally connect with. Uh, I see little reason to photograph something for me that, that I'm, not, I'm not moved or touched by or, th or that doesn't reflect on something a little more deeply in me than my eyes. So. Great. Um, and Laurel has two questions. The first is, where did you get your training? And the second one is going to test your memory a bit. Uh, what type of camera did you use in the 1970s? Okay. She specifically uh, asked 1977. Yes. Uh, a couple of answers. I try, I'm self-trained in my my degree in college was political science, uh, and I had no formal training. I, I, I had become um, enticed by photography earlier on in my life, when I was 12, 13, 14, and I won't go through that story, but then I got put aside and the realities of life and the structure of things took over. Uh, but I, I wrote a column for the campus newspaper, uh, and I hope they all have disappeared. Uh, and I was always late bringing, as I am with everything apparently, bringing my copy. And so I would often arrive at night when the photographer was there, developing his film and making his prints. And I will never forget the, the, the first time, and this is a ubiquitous experience, I was in the dark room with Michael and the print. This thing came up out of, liquid and it was like oh my god you know I'm here save me it took years for that to really come I had after college I had four and a half years in the Air Force and uh, it, I kept an interest in photography doing that during that period and I tried to learn what I could at that point I had a Pratica which is an East German camera a, a, a single lens reflex that was given to me as a graduation present from college uh, and uh, then I went to, after I got out of the Air Force, to India, Nepal, et cetera, et cetera, and I had a Minolta SRT 101, uh, and that was my early camera, and I moved through a number of different cameras, uh, but that was a, probably the camera I was using from the early part of this. Uh, okay, that's it, I guess. Great. Um, Norma wants to know, did you have to get permission from those you photographed to exhibit their image? No. Great. Easy answer. Um, <laughs> and Laurel asks um, why you preferred black and white photography. Why? I don't know, mashed potatoes or rice. I just don't know. I, uh, I mean, there's all kind of possible answers to that. I, I one could be just that that's what first made an impact in me, the early photographic work that moved me. 
uh, Doris Ullman, Dorothea Lang, uh, uh, Robert Frank, I mean, go on and on. All of these people were working mainly in black and white. And I think I understood the power of an image stripped of maybe the, the, the distraction of color, though that's an argument one could easily have because color is everywhere. How could it be a distraction? I just like the simplicity of it. I like that it takes away other things. So, uh, and also I could print black and white. You can't, you can't easily print color. And that's another determinant factor. So I still work you know, not mainly in black and white. Great. Um, I think we can move on now. Okay. So the next section, in 1966, the state of North Carolina and the state of Israel uh, did a, 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 a number of commercial and artistic agreements. And part of it was an exchange of for, and these are their words, artists, visual artists, I think was actually what they described uh, four Israelis would come to North Carolina and four North Carolinian artists would go to Israel for two months. And I very fortunately was one of the four that was chosen from the state to go. And I spent two months and a week or two in Israel, which probably was the most meaningful and moving experience. Uh, it's up there in the top two or three anyway of my life. Uh, so these will be some images from that. Uh, this is again, talk about uh, uh, con contested space as with the workers, this is as you know, very contested space. And it's a place one has to walk through with an open heart and an open mind and a, and a, and a careful attention to the details of life. This is a Sephardic woman at a, at a tomb near Meron uh, during the feast of, and I will mispronounce this, of Lagboma, Lagbioma. Um, and again, the text, I, I'm, I'm, I just love this looking, the prayer, the, the attachment to some truth and some knowledge that has already been codified and, and placed before us. This is a tomb of a Rebbe, uh, in the in the Sephardic tradition that she was praying at. Uh, speaking of transcendent moments, this is a baptism in the Jordan River, and I've never been in a place before. I was tears were just pouring out of me when I took this photograph because this scene had been going on five or six minutes. Behind me were standing fifteen or twenty of her co-religionists singing gospel music. And she was swaying in the water and she wanted to be baptized more than anything in the world. And she didn't want to be baptized more than anything in the world. And she struggled and she cried and she was, sounds are coming out of her and the, the chorus is going on beyond me, behind me. And I'm standing on this railing about to fall over at every moment. And I just, it, to me, it's one of those images for me that sums up much of what I've witnessed in my life. This is in a house of a, uh, of a Arab Israeli. So it's a village and there are a number of these in Israel that are mostly Arab and they're citizens of the state of Israel. And the relationship switches around uh, uh, I saw many, many wonderful interactions between Sabra or native Israelis and Arab Israelis. Uh, they seem to work well together. And then there are moments when they don't seem to work well together. I was invited into this house and in this little village uh, and they fixed a little food for me and gave me some drink. And th this woman who was the, the, the mother uh, and the owner of the house excused herself and got up and left. And she disappeared into this room and I'm outside in a longer room where we ate and the water was left on a table toward the door that I had to walk down to get it. And as I went to the table, I looked into her room where she went and there she was, she was praying. She left, she didn't say a word, she went to pray. And I stood there and because the light was coming in from a door behind me, as I moved the light on her changed, and she looked up and I held my camera. It's one of the things I've learned is you always have your camera and things like this. I 
held my camera up to her, off to the side, and I looked at her, and she nodded. She gave me the most just very subtle, but, but such clear permission. And I picked the camera up, and I took two photographs. Someone came in and shut the door immediately, and the scene was gone. She was still there, but you couldn't, you couldn't see it. And after she finished praying, praying, she came back and joined us. And it was, you know, it was as if she went, you know, outside to let, to, to do anything, any chore, any task, any moment in her day. This is, again, during the Feast of Lagdoma. It's on the top of a, of a synagogue in uh, uh, Meron. Uh, and it's, 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 it's worship, it's religious dancing. The, the, these young Hasidic, uh, uh, and I'm not sure which, which particular Hasidic uh, group, Satmore maybe, they were members of, were on the roof. You can see they're holding hands and they're dancing. And, and it is ecstasy. It is, it is the, one of the most clear and, and, and manifest attempts at reaching a state of oneness, transcendence. Uh, and you can see on the left side that one head, I did a, a long exposure purposefully with the flash. So you, you could see that the, 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 the jumping that was going on, that both of those people, are, it, it, it was quite remarkable uh, to be part of. And I felt, uh, I'm always, always feel like it was a gift. This is in a mosque in Gaza. Now this is a couple of years later. I went back in 1999 and I have meant to go back ever since. Uh, it just has not happened, but it was a mosque right there on, on the Mediterranean in Gaza. The text again, the looking, the, the training, the, 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 the getting the information, um, a young Orthodox boy in a, in a yeshiva, in, this is in Jerusalem, with his phylactery on. Again, this notion of the book, going to the book, looking for the book where the truth is already manifest, the truth is already written, documented, that it's only, it only has to be unlocked again for each and every one of us. Uh, this is a Ethiopian Christian priest uh, right outside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. I'm actually not in the old city. This is a little bit out of the old city where, where his church was. I, I love that photograph. If, if I only took one photograph, I was only allowed to keep one photograph, that would surely be in the, the last three or four that I chose. This is in the old city heading to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. One of the great things about living or being in Israel is that you get to celebrate uh, every feast and festival there is, except the Hindu and the Buddhist ones, which don't seem to show up, but within Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, I mean, there's always something going on. There's always something to take part of that has to do with an eschatology, that has to do with a transcendence, which, which has to do with the way humans order and see their lives on this earth. This was... Easter Sunday 2, there's two of them. There's Easter Sunday 1, which we celebrate, the, the Western Christendom, Protestant, Roman Catholics, and all the derivatives thereof. And then there's Easter 2, which the Orthodox, and don't get me started naming the Orthodox because there are so many of them. Uh, but I have to say that the Orthodox liturgy is one of the most moving, compelling things that I have ever experienced in my life. Uh, Leela and I went to Armenia a few years ago, and I think we spent mo much of our time uh, in the church just listening to the, the uh, amazing l liturgy of the, of the Armenian Catholic Apostle Church, whatever it's called. Anyway, this is on the way to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You can just see the mass of humanity flowing in for Easter Sunday, too. This, I hate, I hate the phrase new age because it's been so derided and so used as a weapon against a different way of thinking. But this is fairly called a, a, a new age gathering of young orthodox, somewhat orthodox, young Jewish people in Israel. It was a new moon 
and it was a new moon Shabbat, and they had gathered on this hilltop to praise the Lord, to gather with each other, to hold hands, uh, to go through the liturgy as they perform it in pretty much traditional fashion, but with a different sense of community and a different sense of belonging. Uh, again, one of those moments in life that I feel very, very lucky and informed to have been part of. I think that's the last of this one. Oh yes, we'll go back and rest there. Uh, any questions on that section? There are actually no questions that came in. Yeah. So if you want to move on and if that's people good. have questions later, we can get to them after. Okay, then there's uh, one, I don't know what comes up next here. Oh, just some other stuff. This is Cuba, uh, Santeria, healing, uh, trying to heal in both in the physical sense and the emotional sense. Uh, this person, it's in Havana. Uh, it's a feast of, at the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe right outside of Mexico City. I love the notion uh, contained in this of religion as both a burden, something you carry, and on the left there, something that's ecstatic and something that leads you up in a way. Uh, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe is another place I could spend the rest of my life watching. Uh, if I went there yearly, I would not be an unhappy person. This is uh, in Mexico in the Yucatan in a little village that this is a Good Friday. So these men had been going around with a group of people uh, to the 12, 13 stations of the cross and at each one they would kneel. And this village happens to be a village from which the last Mayan attempt to throw off the Spanish uh, colonial takeover of, of the Mayan lands in the 18, of that they did it early, but this, in the 1800s, the last attempt called the War of the Cass emanated from. And uh, they, they almost won, but then the crops called them back and literally in that sense. And it's a notion that we don't have today, but the crops called them back. They had to go back and take care of the crops because the crops needed their attention. And it's the way the world stayed in harmony and they, all went back to their villages, uh, put the war down, thinking the Spanish would just, well, okay, we'll wait for them to take care of the crops and come back. And the Spanish came roaring out with a vengeance. And that's the end of that history. This is after the blessing of the statues in Mexico City. Um, this is back to Our Lady, uh, Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. It's where we find hope, I think, is so much of what humans do in life, where we find love, where we find meaningfulness, where we find something that moves us out of the, maybe the quotidian worries and, and difficulties that maybe not all people feel. I know people who seem to have done a fairly good job of walling themselves off from, from the, the great existential currents that seem to to flow, uh, but the mass of humanity isn't able to do that. Uh, this is Cuba, again, this woman is cleaning the way for this penitent, uh, clearing the space for her uh, to let her get to, to the shrine. I think the next two are also from the same place. Yes, this is Cuba, it's a uh, feast of Lazarus. Uh, every year it happens and people from all over Cuba come to this one shrine and they, they let, since Lazarus in the Bible was a healer and a bringer back to life, things like this dead desiccated dog, which this guy is pushing forward with him. And he had been crawling for a couple of days by this point and he's only 500 feet away from the shrine and it, it was unsure whether he was going to actually be able to make it, but he did. Again, another thing this, you know, this humans as if we don't have enough burdens uh, in life, uh, have rocks chained to their legs and they're dragging themselves toward the shrine. Again, as an act of penance, and that, which is another notion that really always intrigued me, the notion of penance, that we have something to be sorry for, that we come into this life already wounded and damaged and stained and we have to do things to remove the stain before we can go on. Uh, that, that theme shows up in a number of images. So I have to say that what I'm showing is a slice through my work. My work exists on either side, whatever that means, of this kind of core that I'm showing. 
but these themes are pretty pretty common. They run left and right. Uh, Cuba, obviously. Uh, and one of the things I didn't understand until my second or third trip to Cuba was the role of Che in Cuban society. Uh, he's not just a revolutionary in the harsh sense of that word. He's a revolutionary in the religious, visionary, healing sense of that word. Che is like the baby Jesus. Uh, and I mean no uh, disrespect to either one of them in that. Che is looked at as the, the healing uh, figure, the, the one who is all-knowing, the one if you just aspire to and follow, you too will, will, will have the victory in the end. So Che is, you see Che all over the country, and here's another picture of Che. He's back there in that window with these two men passing, which is more like a reality. I love that, these, these two men, which you really, who don't know each other, are passing so close in that space. And this Che just sort of floating with that dark shaft moving up toward the image. Oh, welcome back to Asheville. Uh, that was before we became urbane, or is that urban? Urban Outfitters, that's right. CVS Pharmacy, that was Urban Outfitters. The message there is to fear God. Uh, there was a group had gathered out uh, at uh, Pritchett Park, feeling the need to, to tell us uh, that we need to fear God and other such things. It was actually an anti-gay protest at its heart. Uh, the book, text, preachers, lots of them. There's a few of them. This was in New Orleans. The stridency of it is always, I'm always struck by that it's not, in, well, it's not true, it is also. But in many cases, when you see it in, in in, in this form, in this vernacular, uh, there's a lot of stridency that get, that's, that's in Boston, uh, in the commons. Um, and it reminds me also of that picture, that image of Billy Graham we saw earlier. Uh, hope, help, salvation, healing. There was a Marian apparition site in Georgia that I used to go to. Um, for a number of years and then it just sort of disappeared where people gathered every year because the Blessed Virgin appeared to a woman, Nancy Fowler, I think her name was, and everybody came because they were sure the Blessed Virgin was going to come back there in that same place and that same day. And people came who crossed the spectrum of humanity, but many wounded and this man here who's being prayed over and upon, uh, seeking solace, uh, uh, and some other photographs I have of him, his shirt is open and there's just staples and stitches going down uh, his entire front. And the crowd was eager to, to heal him. Ecstatic, overcome, um, the, moment of, of the moment of whatever, transference, transition, uh, I don't know when something else is connected to, whether it's something simply hidden within us or something out of us, I, you know, it's a question. Uh, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, I find myself interested in what happens to young boys. A lot of photographs I have are of young boys being brought into the culture. I didn't realize I was doing that until one day I was looking through my work and I saw there's a number of these images. And here was at a tent revival in Naples, North Carolina. That image is in the show at Blue Spiral also. And this little boy, this was a trailer. You can see the tire at the front right. It was a trailer that was used to bring part of the tent. And on the side of it is this incredible eschatology, this incredible visual story of the end of life, the end times, and what happens. And I was photographing it, and this little boy is just wandering, and I'm just standing there and going, oh my God, what are you doing? You know, and first I'm thinking he's gonna come and ruin my, my picture. I'm trying to take a picture of this thing. And he just wanders into the frame. You get gifts where you get them. You can't, you can't do these things uh, purposefully. And he just wandered in the frame, and he just stood there, and he started staring at this thing, and I just saw the, the image, I mean, I saw the image before I took the photograph. And, and I, I, I have thought so many times looking at this, 
what a thing to tell, what a thing to teach human beings, what a, what a stain to put in a human's heart that, that there is this, this horror, this, this, this thing that's going to happen uh, to us, even perhaps if we lead as good of a life as we can. I'm always troubled by that. And having grown up in a tradition, Catholicism, which is really good at that message, and, and it's very heavy-handed, at least it was, with it, perhaps part of my response to it today is the remembrance of that. Uh, it's that same tent revival, a different boy. Here is, you know, these men who are fully uh, uh, brought into the the tent and to the form of, of, of worship and, and grief and penance and seeking. This little boy who's just swinging in the pole has no clue. Baptism in the Cane River here, um, I don't know, sometime this century, I don't quite remember actually, maybe 2007 or eight. Young boy again, this is in the Mayan territory, being sort of brought in, being told how to kiss the cross. And I like the boy in the left who's watching him very carefully, making sure he gets it just right, make sure he finds the form of, of the, this definition of, of worship and, and uh, that he becomes a member of, of this particular tribe. Uh, this is in Thailand, a Buddhist monastery, again, a young boy, the text looking, seeking, uh, finding the answers, finding the pattern, finding the, the perhaps even the walls and the parameters of life. This is at a burial in Swananoa, that's PJ on the left, and that's his grandmother in the, in the grave. Uh, and, and this, you know, sort of all the way back to the beginning about the, the notion of death and how death is a companion through our lives. And, and we learn about it at some point and then we, we go forward with life. Again, this was at, in, in South Louisiana. Uh, I forget which one of the two or three Iraq wars this was from, but it was a, 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 obviously an army. Um, service member who was killed in Iraq and his burial. This is a traditional New Orleans funeral in the above ground grave that happens to be my father. Uh, and those are all my nieces and nephews and the two men who are helping to, to actually the three, helping to move the coffin into the, the above ground grave. This is Puerto Rico. I love the, the juxtaposition of Jesus and the tombs and the man and the dog and the figure. I bring the Ku Klux Klan in here only because, you know, why not? I mean, they have to exist somewhere, apparently. Uh, this was in Asheville in 1997, maybe. Um, and I brought this in really because of, of the the idea of appropriation, misappropriation of religious symbols and iconography to, to justify any kind of cause. I mean, we see it every day in our lives. We see it in our politics. It's very evident here that there's one, two, three, four crosses on three people. Here, the, you know, the use of a symbol that has one meaning to sanctify something which is the vilification of the very meaning that the cross ostensibly means is, is again one of those amazing things and we're almost at the end everybody if you're still with me um good friday in uh deep louisiana La La lafitte louisiana way at the end of the road uh man was walking with his cross on wheels uh, i just happened to see a little article in the paper that there was going to be a little ceremony down on good friday so i so i thought i'd drive down and see what i could see and that's what i saw and this is a priest in Armenia, which is a hint of a coming project. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, it's a very kind, actually a very beautiful man who was in a church that was so far back in the mountains. It was just amazing. It was one of those old 13th, 13th century, 14th, 12th century monasteries. Uh, just a magnificent place and a magnificent 
individual to spend time with. That's the end of that section, and we're going to go to that section next if we still have time, but if we out of time, we can stop. Any questions on this? Um, I, we do have one question uh, from Micah. Uh, they are asking, what are your current projects in black and white and any on current social justice issues? Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to jump into my, one of my oncoming project, not oncoming, ongoing, pro I have three, I always have two or three projects, it seems like, in the work, just to keep my anxiety levels high. Uh, so I'll show you that, I'll answer that by the next thing, and even though the next slide is in color, I just did it to wake everyone up. Uh, I think it will answer the second part of that question also. There are so many good photographers working. And really, the, the world is filled with young photographers that are just so active and doing cutting work and deep work and, and social just, justice issues that I find my going there to be redundant. Uh, and it's not that I'm not uh, uh, deeply moved by the, the, the situation in which we're all living, uh, I find that there are people there who are addressing that with an eloquence that uh, I need not to, to step into. So, but I'll show you what project I'm working on uh, and I'll try to be quick through this. It's only 10, 12 slides. Uh, so, Cherokee, North Carolina. Uh, I first came to Cherokee as a young man with a family. I was a child, actually, with my family. And I remember being struck by the strangeness of this creation, a reservation. There were people living there, and, and it was called a reservation. It's not actually correct in, in the case of the eastern band of the Cherokee, but uh, there was this town. And I was very moved and, and, and troubled by that. And years later, I came back, and finally I moved here, and I started going to Cherokee, and I, I was struck by how uh, the, uh, people had been taken and dispossessed and then trivialized and then used. I can guarantee you these things were not owned then by, by Cherokee. And, and, and their visage was being used, it was being monetized. So I started a project kind of looking at that as I look at things and, and it led to in a couple of slides on to the project I've been working on, actually longer than I thought. But uh, so th this is from that early Cherokee stuff. The you know the idea of a man and grandfather sitting outside collecting tips with his not even um, authentic in this case headdress. I found humiliating to me, much less how it must have felt to him. And the same thing here, these, these must have been a father and daughter or even a grandfather and daughter with the, with the baby of this guy who's, you know, a little sign behind the guy's legs says tips. This is 1979, I think. So it's been a project, an area I've been trying to work in for a long time. But what really got me was, the, was when I started understanding the full story, the full impact of of the dispossession uh, of, of the native, the indigenous people, that a project that I first envisioned as just doing a little exploration of what is called the Trail of Tears. And I avoid that term a lot because it's so overused and it sounds like, oh, well, this has been done 10,000 times. Uh, it's a project I call Broken Sorrow. Uh, and I call it broken sorrow because you would you would think that there would be a certain sorrow on both sides of this equation, uh, and yet it seems to me that that sorrow has been broken. That something has come between a notion of the of the shared humanities and that in the dispossession came a hardening of a sense of our responsibilities as human beings. So I started this this project uh, seriously. That is with the function, I think it's 1989. Uh, and what I did is I started to follow the Trail of Tears. And I followed the Trail of Tears with the conceit that I am traveling it as if I were one of the Cherokee who were removed in 1838, not by their own will, of course. And I could see what has happened upon the land that I passed through during my removal. And this custom killing thing just struck me as something like, uh, I don't know, it was just such a 
thing. Anyway, so there's two images here that came from that 18, I mean, 18, 1989 journey. Uh, and again, this, this idea of, of killing things and then but making an image of the thing, I, it, it just all, fi I find it all so, so curious and fascinating. So this was in Illinois, the, this one was in Kentucky. The Trail of Tears goes up through Kentucky, Illinois, drops down to Arkansas. Anyway, so a few years ago, I decided this project has been loitering in my brain for a long time. A few years ago, I decided I had to get back on it and do it and do it in a way that felt comfortable to me. So I started working again on the removal routes, but also, I mean, on, yeah, the, on the removal routes. And there's a number of them, there's seven or eight known routes at the Cherokees were removed on out of Georgia and Western North Carolina and moved to Oklahoma. Uh, and also the Roundup routes. And it's a little known thing, surprisingly here, that there are many, many areas in Western North Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, where the Cherokee were rounded up and, and, and forced into these makeshift forts in, 19, in 1837 and 1838. So I started working on the route Roundup and removal ride routes on a project called Broken Sorrow, and it's very much in its infancy. Uh, I, I want to travel the entire northern route, uh, which goes right through Nashville, and also one of the water routes uh, and photographs. So here, here is just some stuff on this route. Uh, in so this is in Western North Carolina, outside of Murphy. Again, this is one of the. the, the Roundup routes. This is what you see today um, when you come there. This is in um, between Hayesville and Murphy uh, on that road. And I'll tell you a story about Hayesville in a moment. I think I have an image. Again, I'm, I'm trying to see this as if I hadn't been around for a couple hundred years and I was familiar with this land. That lake wasn't there either. That's a TBA lake. And, and I came, the power lines were purposeful. I, I wanted to make sure that I had these, these little ephemera of, of modernity in the photographs. Um, I just love the signs. I mean, the, even the notion of having a, a sign uh, out on the road with, with lettering and things in and of itself would be uh, a thing. That is on one of the removal routes. You, you can look at a culture and understand what you, a culture honors by, by looking at what they put up, their, their flags, the causes that seem to mot motivate them. I was, a, I am a veteran of the Vietnam era. Um, and I did not go to Vietnam, very thankfully, but I served during that era. And, um, you know, nonetheless, when I see, I, I don't know how to, to word this, except that um, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. But this is again on one of the routes um, of removal of the Cherokee uh, from this land. Again, this land was, none of this existed in, in 1838. So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to see what, this is in Cedartown, Georgia. Um, a lot of Cherokee came out of Cedartown and they got marched up to Northern Georgia. That whole Northwest Georgia was pretty clear to the Cherokee. This is in Cleveland, Tennessee. So this is right, right outside of Hayesville, North Carolina. Uh, that's a statue, as you can tell, there's a no trespassing sign on it with like the gate, the fence. Uh, the whole setup is really, really interesting to me. This is maybe a thousand yard, no, a thousand feet from where Fort Hemby was. And it was a fort that was built in 1837, a year before the removal of the Cherokee in preparation for the removal of the Cherokee. A number of forts were built uh, they knew they were going to do this, they being us, knew that this was going to be done, and they built a fort, 
And the town of Hayesville exists today only because of that fort. That fort was built, there was no town there. A, a little support system developed around the town. The Cherokee were rounded up, put into that fort. And then when they got enough of them, they marched them to Fort Butler in Murphy. And then from there up the Unicoi Turnpike and across over uh, Tennessee and down into uh, Cleveland, Calhoun, Charleston, Tennessee, where they amassed thousands of Cherokees. And from there is when they started moving them out on one of these seven or nine routes uh, to Oklahoma. Um, this is in Nashville. Again, uh, you know, if you just happen to show up, if you fell to earth, having not been around for a couple of hundred years, you know, it's probably a thing you would go, oh, what? Uh, the, the, the trail of one of the removal trails, the Northern Trail, goes directly through Nashville, through downtown Nashville, and it crosses the Cumberland River right there at the foot of the Titan Stadium. This is in Dayton, Georgia. Actually, it was the home of the Scopes trial, too, uh, which was, an, I don't think there's any connection between those two things, but I always like the fact that the Scopes trial was held in Dayton, Tennessee. This is a long way from a, a, a tribal village. Uh, way of living and a, and a different connection to the beyond, a different connection to your own and identity and entity and, and um, way of living. That also, as I recall, was in Cedartown. And this is the road from Dayton, Tennessee, going back the other, the other way. And, and it is literally the path uh, that the Cherokee, some of the Cherokee were on during their removal. Okay, so this is the end. Uh, this is a, a, a detail from a photograph I took uh, in 1977 in front of the main post office in Asheville when they used to have nice, big, beautiful buildings with things meant to make us feel good, chiseled into the stone, happiness to the people through swift and unfailing communication. Uh, I'd like to take this moment to thank Kristen, who's been wonderful to work with, and the museum, and Pam for her her kindness through the years and, and uh, her, her uh, including me into the museum family and for everyone who's taken part in this today and for the people in my life who have really been meaningful and there are many, but uh, there are some, uh, Randy Scholl and Hetty Fisher have been great, great friends. Jay Richard Gruber, Rick sitting out there has been really great. My, uh, my partner, Leela has brought great joy uh, to my life and um, it's been a good period uh, and I want to thank all of you for this sharing this time with me and I hope there's some more questions I'm available if there are and if not we'll see each other as we move beyond this period I hope of, of uh, physical distancing from each other thank you Thank you so much, Ralph. Your work is so powerful, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing your Blue Spiral exhibition. Um, I just got to print it. Yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> Good. Well, thank Good you. I, I really do appreciate it, and um, thank you to all our members for joining us today. We went a little over time, oh, but I, I think you'll all agree that it was absolutely worth it. Um, so I, I hope you all continue to engage with us virtually through these member programs and activities we have on our museum from homepage. As a reminder, I'll send out a program evaluation in a little bit to collect your feedback, and I hope to see many of you again for the next program. Stay healthy and stay safe, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you again, and thank you, Ralph. Thank you, and I'm sorry I went over. I, I don't have a oh. clock here, but here we are. Don't even worry about it. I, it was great. I enjoyed every moment of it. Well, thank so, you. Thank, thank you, everybody, for taking the time for yeah. being here. Thanks everyone, stay well. Bye.